thank you so much for uh, coming out this evening uh, to watch the film To What Really Is, probably the most beautiful cinema in London, so a great place to spend some time. Growing up in the 80s, there was only one version I saw and knew of about Bangladesh, and that was the natural disasters. Fierce cyclones culminating in the worst floods in history. The desperation of helpless people having their lives washed away from beneath their feet was all you ever saw on the news. The worst floods in the world were then replaced by the worst working conditions in the world following the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Dhaka in April 2013 when over a thousand garment workers died. This is a country where its people have suffered from the very beginning. The birth of Bangladesh is a bloody one. The War of Independence in 1971 saw over 300,000 people killed. But that revolution was made possible by the mass uprising of Bangladeshi people. This same revolutionary side of Bangladesh surfaced again last month culminating on Monday with the overthrowing of the government, an authoritarian government with fascist policies that didn't provide people with the promise of the freedom the nation had been built on. One of the controversial and dangerous values that of the government had was to try and silence artists. A Digital Security Act was passed in 2018, policing what people said and did online, particularly anyone speaking in favour of secularism. The act allowed people to be detained without a warrant, simply for sharing their opinions. Many of them disappeared. Others were imprisoned or tortured, and they included journalists, cartoonists, musicians, and artists. And this is one of the themes that debut filmmaker Rezwan Sharia Summit explores in The Salt in Our Waters. In some ways, it's a universal tale. City dweller moves to the countryside, resulting in a culture clash. But the story goes much deeper than general conflict. The location that you'll see in the film is a typical small fishing village. These are found along the coast of the Bay of Bengal, which has the longest natural sea beach in the world. So you'll find 20 to 30 homes lived in by fishermen in clusters, and these will be dotted along the coast. Now these communities have very strong conservative and superstitious values. In fact, superstition, guides their life. So when our protagonist, Rudro, turns up with his art studio and moves into a close-knit community, the reaction to his work, although it may seem absurd to an outsider, in fact is how the world is seen according to the fishermen. But why are they so fixated on these ideals? Well, the fishing communities of Bangladesh have a very different way of life to city dwellers and even rural villages because their lives are at risk every single day. They are the climate change frontliners, experiencing the very present effect of rising sea levels and unstable weather. Because their lives are so fragile, they have a deeper relationship with God. So when things go wrong, their reasoning is based around spiritual beliefs, not the science of global climate change, but the fear that if they do something wrong, they must be upsetting God. In creating the characters, Rezwan also wanted to show how extremis is extremism isn't only violence, but it can actually start subtly. It's in these subtle moments that slip through comments and actions that become acceptable, which ultimately results in a kind of slow burning rise of extremism and extremist values. Now, Bangladesh is the fourth most populous country in the world, 
but it doesn't actually have a tangible film industry. It makes television dramas, and there's some indie filmmaking. Notable directors known internationally include Mustafa Sawa Faruqi, whose 2019 film Saturday Afternoon, set in a Dhaka cafe where a terrorist attack takes place, is a film I highly recommend watching. But it was actually banned in Bangladesh because the Bangladeshi Film Censor Board thought that the film would tarnish, would tarnish Bangladesh's reputation. And in fact, if you look at Mustafa's Wikipedia page, the film isn't even mentioned even though that ban was lifted last year. So when it comes to independent filmmaking in Bangladesh, trying to get funding is impossible. And that's why Rezwan applied to the Spike Lee Fellowship for support. So each year, Spike Lee awards grants to five film projects, and The Salts in Our Waters was successful in being funded in 2016. So as well as financial support, Rezwan also received one-to-one -one sessions with Spike. And when he asked him why he chose to fund the film, he said that this was a film about a place and a community rarely seen in a cinema and in any other form of storytelling. Not only are the fishing communities of Bangladesh unknown to the world, despite being those communities who right now are bearing the brunt of climate change, even city dwellers in Dhaka are unaware of their plight. They know that the coast is where fish comes from, but they aren't so familiar with the struggles to catch it. 90% of the film's cast are non-professional actors and they were actually gathered from the village where the filming takes place and some neighbouring villages as well. Rezwan spent months simply hanging out and getting to know the local community to build their trust. There's actually no rehearsals with the villagers, but there was a round table reading of the script. He really wanted the villagers to actually approve it before he made it, and that was very much part of the way that he engaged with them. There are five key roles played by theatre actors, but they're not so adept at kind of doing screen um, acting. <laughs> My favourite character in the film to look out for is the village chairman. The way he delivers his lines reminds me of the busybody men I knew growing up in North London who always had to have their say. When I was a teenager, I made a documentary that was screened on Channel 4, and I wanted to film in my local mosque. And I remember his type. <laughs> they literally were just like completely anti-female filmmaker and didn't want me to go near them or do anything like this. You know, it was kind of like shameful to be doing this. But thankfully, my own parents never gave in to these elders of the community. And I guess that was pretty much the beginnings of my journalist career. So, we have a debut director, we have a modest budget, we have a cast of untrained actors and a location with extreme weather conditions. And to top it all off, filming took place during the monsoon season. So this is the months of the year when Bangladesh gets around 80% of its annual rainfall. But these are the conditions that make this film so captivating to watch. It opens with a desolate grey seascape, and this is the real colour. Captured at a time when the sea and the sky and the beaches are all grey. It sets a melancholic tone for some of the bleakness that Rudro is about to experience. The cinematography is exquisite. One of Spike Lee's suggestions to Rezwan was that as this was his directorial debut, he should surround himself with an experienced team. So he chose Chananum Chaturungdraj, who is a film, who is a director of photography that grew, she grew up in Thailand, and she was actually experienced in shooting Thai fishing communities. And it's worth knowing that the film was shot entirely with a handheld camera. The Salt in Our Waters hasn't yet been released, but it has been screened at several film festivals, as well as COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference. So tonight, you are still among the few people who've had a chance to enjoy this masterpiece. So thank you for coming, and welcome to the 
unknown, intriguing world of the Ilishmuch fishermen. <laughs>